If men live in myths and not absolutes, there is nothing we can do or say about that. But we can argue for non-destructive myths. This is the task that would be the general science of society. My previous video was a critique of the hero's journey, and I cited Urs Becker's resonating call for non-destructive myths that I just repeated. Those are myths that are not driven by heroic vengeance, destruction, or conquest. Becker believed that these were counterproductive to the advancement of society, and that the predominance of these myths were holding us back in primitive states of our human animalistic behavior. What Becker failed to realize was that these non-destructive myths were ever-present and existed right alongside other myths for centuries. For instance, as I will discuss later, the myths of Inanna, Isis and Demeter. And I too must admit that although I knew the name of Demeter and her daughter Persephone from Greek mythology, I was not as familiar with the other myths until I read Gail Carriger's book, The Heroine's Journey, which is a critique of the overuse of the hero's journey, not just in myths, but in modern storytelling. Her book is targeted at modern novelists and storytellers promoting an alternative to the hero's journey. And that is what I'm here to break down today. This is part two. My first video was on the hero's journey itself, which honestly you can skip if you're pretty much familiar with the hero's journey from Joseph Campbell. That video wasn't very good anyway, and it does have a copyright strike from Warner Brothers, so all the ad revenue just goes to them. After Joseph Campbell published his book on comparative mythology, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where we get the hero's journey from, it took a while for a female student of his to naturally think, well, if there is a hero's journey, that is comprised of masculine leading narratives that exist over time and throughout different cultures, then there must also be feminine leading myths that transcend different cultures and time periods. And Maureen McCormick was that student. She was specifically a student of Campbell. She published her first major work in 1990, naming The Heroine's Journey. That is not the book I'm discussing today, and her structure of A Heroine's Journey is different than the one I will be discussing from Gail Carriger's. Hers is much more unique feminist academic take on female narratives, which is completely valid, but I'm just not covering in this video. I would like to cover it perhaps in a follow-up video one day. However, I mention her work for two reasons. One, she coined the term The Heroine's Journey, and two, for this anecdote that she mentions in her book, that when she presented her work to her mentor, Joseph Campbell, he unfortunately replied with a rather misogynistic retort that women don't need to make the journey. In the whole mythological tradition, women are there. They are there at the end of a journey. They are not the ones going on a journey. And at this point in the video, I'd like to state that I do not condone the actions of all men, but I'm willing to take the blame and apologize on their behalf. I obviously grew up loving film and television, as boys do, dreaming of flying a Millennium Falcon, fighting for justice alongside Batman, but also saving the townsfolk from an outbreak of cholera with Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, because I often had to watch television with my mother and older sister, and when there's only one television in the house, you're at the mercy of other people's viewing preferences, which gave me a unique exposure to feminine-leaning programming. Later in life, friends, my wife, my children have all remarked on this. In particular, I remember being in the military and being mocked for owning copies of Mona Lisa's Smile and Love Actually. But this is all to say, Campbell's retort, although uncouth, was at least correct in one aspect of his dismissal of the heroine's journey. That women, in his gender normative view of his hero's journey represent what the hero is running from and returning to at the end of the journey. That is stasis and domestication. And to sum up my critique of the hero's journey that I presented in my last video, the hero's journey narrative promotes individuality, isolation, revenge, soul accomplishment against overwhelming odds, and success only defined by violence, death, and conquest. And the hero's journey demotes ideas of collaboration and asking for help. Before I go into the heroine's journey that Gail promotes, I would like to describe the difference between gendered protagonist and gender narrative, as explained by Gail Carriger in her book, that names are constructed as a dichotomy based on gender the same way gender itself is socially constructed, not defined by scientific truths, but of social interaction. 
The structure of a heroine's journey can be found in ancient examples of goddesses and demigoddesses in the same comparative mythology that Joseph Campbell used to discover the hero's journey. They are constructed narratively to lean towards traits that most people, Campbell included as he demonstrated, have decided are masculine and or feminine traits. As Campbell pointed out to him, it is masculine to go on an adventure and it is feminine to stay home. And that sentiment is a part of the heroine's journey. Now with that out of the way, we're going to be looking at the steps and story beats of Gail Carriger's heroine's journey, and I will be using examples from the myth of Demeter. In her book, Gail also provides two other examples of feminine deity myths as examples that these stories are universal. And if you're interested in the full explanation of those myths, I strongly suggest you read her book. The link is in the description, and if you stay to the end of the video, I will explain how you can win a free copy from me. Part 1. The Myth of Demeter Demeter, a Greek goddess of the grain and harvest, is also a devout mother to her daughter Persephone. The myth begins with a sexual assault and kidnapping of Persephone by the god of the underworld Hades. Demeter, beside herself with grief, seeks the help of the gods on Mount Olympus, only to find that Zeus was aware of the incident and, depending upon the structure of the myth, allowed it or brokered it himself. The other gods do not interfere with what has already happened, and Demeter, enraged, denounces her position with the gods, and she goes on search for her daughter alone. While on this search, she neglects her duties to provide fertility to the earth, leading to a famine that plagues the humans. Well, on this search, she connects with many people, human and god alike, to aid her in her search. Particularly, she contacts Helios, the god of the sun, who confesses that he was aware that Zeus and Hades had made a deal for Persephone, which further infuriates Demeter. But Helios is another god who will not go to war with Hades or Zeus on her behalf. Demeter doubles down on her demands for her daughter's safe return, and swears she will never allow anything to grow on Earth again without the return of her daughter. Zeus brokers a deal and a bargain is struck with Hades, who will allow Persephone to ascend to Earth two-thirds of every year and return to the underworld for one-third. So Persephone is reunited with her mother, and together they welcome the spring, enjoy the summer and the harvest together before she is set to return to the underworld. Now, let's explore the story beats of Gale Carriger's heroine's journey using examples from this myth. The first step is loss. Gale begins her journey by calling it descent. I am calling it loss here first because I find the important part of the heroine's journey is that the inciting incident is committed against the protagonist and the heroine only takes action in response to get back what is lost. Their journey is involuntary unlike the hero who takes the journey reluctantly but is a specific volunteer. In my previous video, I showed how Frodo chose to take the ring himself, how Diana volunteered to face Ares, and Chief Brody chose to go along with Quentin Hooper to kill the shark. The second step is rejection. As an example of the differences between the hero's and the heroine's journey, the heroine's second step is to appeal for help from a higher power or authority. Demeter appeals to other gods, but they reject her pleas for help. They will not use their power to help. In other heroine's journeys, friends and families offer aid to the heroine, but it will not succeed without her being on the journey herself. Step three is withdraw. After her initial loss and the rejection of her pleas for help, the heroine withdraws from the familiar world and enters the unknown world without family and friends to help. The search. The search in a heroine's journey often involves a mystery, looking for clues, gaining allies, and identifying foes. This is similar to the trials stage of the hero's journey. However, a heroine spends a great deal of time fostering relationships. In the myths of Isis and Inanna, those goddesses practice cultivating civilization, teaching farming and building temples along their path. The heroine always leaves the campsite better than they found it, unlike the hero in the hero's journey. Next step is descent. In the story of Demeter, she does not enter the underworld, but compels Zeus to go there and barter a deal for her. In other feminine leading myths, 
the heroine must enter the underworld, similar to what Joseph Campbell in The Hero's Journey would have called entering or being in the belly of the beast. That is the lowest point in the journey, which there is no way to go but up. The hero does this alone often, but a heroine uses her network of support brought with her to escape the underworld or deal with whoever she finds down there, such as Demeter, who used her support network to go down there and barter a deal. This leads to the next step, and the biggest difference in the hero and heroine's journey. The sixth step is compromise. Besides the involuntary aspect of the journey itself, this is the biggest difference. A heroine is not limited to dealing out death and destruction to get what they want. They even attempt to avoid this at all costs. Demeter does not destroy Ares, but instead makes a deal with him. Her daughter will return in the spring and go back to him in the fall, a classic compromise symbolic of Mother Nature's cycle of destruction and rebirth. The next step is healing. The relationship between the lost parties are healed through reconciliation. And finally, home. The heroine returns home to stasis, content with the new state of things. The world is not the same as before, but the compromise makes the world bearable. Next, let's look at some examples from popular modern films. Starting with the 2003 animated film, Finding Nemo. Loss. At the beginning of the film, Marlin, a clownfish, is the single father to his son, Nemo. Their relationship is already strained due to Marlin's overbearing protectiveness of his only son. No, you can't swim well. I can swim fine, Dad, okay? No, you know what? We'll start school in a year or two. No, Dad, just because you're scared of you. You think you can do these things, but you just can't, Nemo. I hate you. Who, in the midst of this fight, is lost or kidnapped by scuba divers. Rejection. Throughout the movie, Marlon makes several pleas to anybody he meets for assistance in finding his son. A white boat! They took my son! My son! Help me! Please! Some offer aid to varying levels of effectiveness. Oh, hey, I've seen a boat! You have? Uh-huh, and it passed by not too long ago. A white one? Hi, I'm Dory. Where? What? Particularly, Dory offers assistance in the search, but her short-term memory causes as many setbacks as they do advances. Stop following me, okay? What are you talking about? You're showing me which way the boat went. A boat? Hey, I've seen a boat. It passed by not too long ago. It, it went, um, this way. It went this way. Follow me. Withdraw. Marlon is away from his family, Nemo, and the security of his community in the coral reef. He has never been in the open ocean and is an unfamiliar and full of peril. Search. Marlin's search begins across the ocean and in contact with other sea life. Over time, his encounters add up to enough of a support network for him to finally reach his destination and even get communication through to his son Nemo to let him know he is looking for him. Nemo, where's Nemo? I've got to speak with him. What? What is it? Your dad's been fighting the entire ocean looking for you. My father? Descent. Marlin and Dory find themselves in the literal belly of the beast when they are swallowed by a whale, only to find that this whale has heard of Marlin's story from Dory and the other ocean creatures. This is again an example of his built network and community assisting him in his search. And the whale delivers Marlin to his destiny. Thank you, sir. Wow. Compromise. Nemo and Marlin are finally reunited, but there is more hurdles to overcome, as Marlin and Nemo must compromise on his independence. I can do this! You're right. Healing. With the compromise made, the relationship that was broken at the beginning of the journey before the loss is also healed, as well as the family being reunited. And the final step, home. Marlin and Nemo return home, and Marlin honors the relationship and compromise, trusting his son to venture out into the world and return home. For our next example, we are going to be looking at the 2022 film Thor Love and Thunder. 
Thor, having been away on a cycle of hero's adventures, finds a suitable home with the Guardians of the Galaxy. However, his hero ways die hard, and we can see from the beginning that Thor's heroic tendencies lead to more destruction than to the group efforts that the Guardians are more known for. We use our hearts and our minds to defeat the enemy with minimal loss or damage. A special note here is that the Guardian films are much more like heroines journeys than they are heroic journeys because they are about a group coming together and working together. This fractured relationship leads Thor to return home to New Asgard where he finds the village under attack by shadow monsters that distract the Asgardians in battle while their children are stolen. A family connection is broken and there is a loss to the main characters. Rejection. Thor, along with Jane Foster, who now has the power of Thor, as well as the director in mocap and the character Valkyrie, aware that they face an enemy capable of defeating gods in battle, they set off on a request for help from Marvel's pantheon of cross-cultural gods, with the Greek Zeus at the head. Their pleas for help are rejected. Pretty boy, you go back to your seat and you be quiet. Uh, I'm sorry, did you not hear any of what I just said. He's, he's murdering en masse. Shaggy! Just as Zeus rejected Demeter's pleas. Nick, panic is not good. We are safe here. You, my friend, you are safe here. So cheer, baby cake. Have some wine, have some grape. Is this the purpose of the gods? To hide away in a golden palace like cowards? Maybe we have lost our way. You know what? And we'll stop him ourselves. Withdrawal. The heroes are forced to withdraw as they search for the missing children. Which they do alone, away from formal support networks, particularly the other gods. Descent. The belly of the beast moment happens when the companions are lured to a colorless planet. The gods will use you. But they will not help you. There is no eternal reward for us. And are tortured against each other to give up the weapon that will bring about their own destruction. Because the companions care so deeply for each other, the enemy is able to use their weakness to his advantage. Compromise. At the end of the film, the enemy has won. Jane is dying, and Thor offers his enemy, Gore the God Killer, a compromise. Why would I spend my last moments with you when I can be with her? I choose love. You can too, you can bring her back. That compromise is that if he forgets his conquest, forgets his revenge, and instead uses the power he has thus achieved to bring his only daughter back from the dead. I know your pain, but this isn't the way. It's not death or revenge that you seek. What do I seek? You seek love. The negotiation ends with Thor promising to care for his enemy's child. Healing. The pain that Gore felt is relieved when he sacrifices himself to bring back his deceased daughter and dies in peace. As well, Thor makes peace with the loss of Jane. Home. Thor enters a domestic setting and is good to his word as he cares for his new adopted daughter. Next, I will be discussing the Harry Potter film series, which went from 2001 to 2011, as well as the book series that inspired it. But I will mostly be talking about the first film and the last film here. Loss. From the start of the series, Harry has lost his family, and that loss has defined his life as he lives in near total isolation under a staircase of a family that does not care for or want him. This is also an example of the second step, rejection. That's running well. Look, look, Harry's got a letter! Take you back, it's mine! Yours? They'll be writing to you. 
Harry's pleas to learn about his parents or simply to receive correspondence from his parents' close friends is constantly rejected by his substitute and inept caregivers. Withdraw. Harry withdraws from the world that he grew up in in search for a life in the wizarding world, the world of his parents that is unknown to him. Everybody he meets has either heard of him or knew his parents. Yes, my soul. It's Harry Potter. Doris Crockford, Mr. Potter. I can't believe I'm meeting you at last. And Harry quickly becomes engrossed in his new life, making friends and establishing a new network of community and support that will aid him both in his studies and in the coming adventure. Search. The search for Harry's parents, or just knowledge about his parents' life, is a cyclical adventure structure for the series. In learning more about his parents and his own past, he is also confronted with the mysteries that surround the Dark Wizard. Voldemort. Voldemort. Your parents fought against him. But nobody lived once he decided to kill him. Nobody. Not one. Except you. The two mysteries are intertwined. The more he learns about one, the more danger he puts himself into. Her life for her only son, she provided the ultimate protection. I could not touch him. It was old magic. Descent. Several times Harry descends into an underworld. It seems to almost happen in every film. He is lord tricked into a dark place, but he never travels alone. He always takes his support network with him, and that is what gives him strength and helps him to make it through these obstacles that lay in his path. In the end battle of the series, these networks are important to the victory because it is their heroic actions that end up saving the day. And this also happens throughout the series. Harry is often near death or defeat at the end of each film or story only to be saved by his support network that he built up. Harry, when the connection is broken, you must get to the port key. We can linger for a moment to give you some time, but only a moment. Do you understand? Harry. Compromise. Harry's goal is never to defeat, kill, or conquer his enemy. This man is... I know what he is, but we'll take him to the castle. His actions are always defensive in nature. In his final encounter with the enemy, he does not cast a spell to kill his enemy, but to disarm him. And that is ultimately what overcomes this evil. That also through the convoluted Holcrux plot is in him all along. And Harry now lives in a world filled with compromise. Healing. The healing comes in the epilogue that circles back all the way to the first compromise of the film series, where Harry fears being put into the wrong Hogwarts house. What if I am put in Slytherin? Slytherin House will have gained a wonderful young wizard. If it really means that much to you, you can choose Gryffindor. The Sorting Hat takes your choice into account. Demonstrating that conflict that is always within him. And home... The series always ends at the end of a school year where Harry has to return to his caregivers in the human world, leaving behind his support network and placing himself back into isolation all the way up until the final film series, which does not end with a separation, but ends with him and his newfound family representing a stable stasis that Harry's life was without for so long as they now bid farewell to their own children that then go on their own journeys. Part 4. The Heroics of a Heroine's Journey When you know what you're looking for, the heroine's journeys are everywhere. In the late age of the comic book movie Boone that we live in, we see that most origin solo comic book movies are classic hero's journeys, such as Iron Man, Batman, Wonder Woman, as I previously discussed in my last video. However, the recent team-up movies, or the crossover movies, where heroes from their own origin heroes' journey stories meet up and work together to defeat a larger threat, are naturally heroines' journeys because they involve 
community and working together. They are not solo adventures where one person defeats an enemy, but it is done collectively. We have to act now, and not one of us can do it without the others. This shows that there's still room for heroes and heroics in these stories. Many of the films I've talked about feature heroic moments. Come forward and join us, or die. Doesn't matter that Harry's gone. Stand down, never. People die every day. They didn't die in vain. But you will. Because you're wrong. It's not over. The key that I would like to emphasize is that the heroes are not solely bent on destruction, death, or conquering their enemies, but are at least amenable to compromise. They display empathy and compassion. Before we conclude, I would like to offer one more comparison, a bridge perhaps between the heroes and the heroine's journey, and that comes from the 1987 film The Princess Bride. I'm not going to go through all the heroine's journey steps for this one because there's not really enough of them to make it worth it. At its heart, this is a love story where two partners are separated, one lost at sea and the other is set to marry a prince she does not love, and they must reunite. Wesley, the poor farm boy turned pirate, searches for his love that is kidnapped. He defeats the kidnappers and rescues his love only for them to be once again separated. You can see how the story takes elements from both narratives. There is a hero going on a quest voluntarily facing trials, and there is also a heroine being forced onto a quest. However, the hero I'm talking about is not Wesley. The hero is Indigo Montoya. This is a character that seeks revenge for himself, revenge for his lost father. He chooses to go on this adventure. Without a word, the six-fingered man slash him through the heart. I love my father. So naturally, I challenge his murderer to a duel. When I was strong enough, I dedicated my life to the study of fencing. He is the one that better fits the hero journey narrative. But when he attempts to go alone, as heroes do, he cannot succeed. It is only with help that he eventually succeeds, and help from his found friends and community that was established by the heroine Wesley. And here you can see the difference between Wesley's adventure and Indigo's adventures, which represent the dichotomy between the hero and the heroine. Indigo is consumed by vengeance and believes he can only accomplish his goal and find fulfillment through violence. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die and the death of his enemy. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Now. Offer me money. Yes. Power to promise me that. All that I have and more. Offer me everything I ask for. Anything you want. I want my father back, you son of a bitch. Ugh. Whereas Wesley, in the end, lets his enemy live, even though this man tried to take his life not long ago. Because Wesley is not driven by vengeance, he only longs for the return to his domestic life with his lover. Will I dispatch him for you? Thank you, but no. Whatever happens to us, I want him to live a long life alone with his cowardice. Even Indigo admits that the act of revenge leaves him feeling empty, lost, and unfulfilled at the end. It's very strange. I have been in the revenge business so long. Now that it's over, I don't know what to do with the rest of my life. He is like the heroes that we mentioned at the end of my last video, isolated, alone, and without direction. Whereas Wesley, the heroine, is able to offer Indigo a kindness. Have you ever considered piracy? You'd make a wonderful Dread Pirate Roberts. Because he understands fulfillment, having reunited with his love. And let's not forget also, the entire framing device of this film itself is centered on a grandfather reading a book to his reluctant audience. Are you trying to trick me? Where's the sports? Is this a kissing book? A grandson that is not interested in this story because he perceives the book to be feminine. Does it get good? Keep your shirt on, let me read. Halfway through the readings, outraged that the villain is going to survive, that Wesley is not going to defeat him and achieve a destructive victory over evil and oppression. He kills Prince Humperdinck. At the end, somebody's got to do it. Is it Inigo who? Nobody. Nobody kills. He lives. 
Rather, they will continue to live in a world surrounded by both good and evil. But this empathy is a power to Wesley. Wesley does not kill any of his enemies. Please understand, I hold you in the highest respect. I do not envy you the headache you will have when you're awake. But in the meantime, rest well. Dream of large women. Except for Vincini, who kind of dies of his own hubris rather than Wesley's actual hand. And it is this act of kindness that saves Wesley in the end. His mercy turns his former enemies into allies, Indigo included. I need the man in black. What? He bested you with strength, your greatness. He bested me with steel. He must have outthought Vicini. And a man who can do that can plan my castle onslaught any day. And all this reminds me of one of my favorite Abraham Lincoln quotes. And it's a good way to end this video, as I can humbly conceive. Towards the end of the Civil War, when he was offering clemency to his Southern Confederates that had rebelled against their own country, somebody asked Mr. Lincoln, why he does not destroy his enemies once and for all. And Mr. Lincoln replied, do I not defeat my enemy by making him my friend? This is the important message of the heroine's journey. There is little anybody can accomplish on their own. We all must ask for and accept help in our lives if we are to achieve anything. And building that type of network and community should be a part of our pop culture landscape. And a quick look at the top grossing films shows that there are quite a few films up there that I would consider heroine's journey or heroine's leaning narrative. Avatar, of course, is more of a classic hero's journey about revenge and conquest, but its sequel, The Way of Water, is much closer to a heroine's journey with the protagonist seeking new networks and community and sparing the enemy's lives. Avengers Endgame is a culmination of multiple heroes' journeys, but at its heart is also a story of seeking to return loved ones through at least nonviolent means through much of the first part of the movie. But also, as I mentioned, the crossover film, such as the original Avengers team-up movie, is much closer to a heroine's journey. Therefore, the future for non-destructive myths, as Ernest Becker called for, is bright. And I hope to make more videos on this topic highlighting these types of films. This has been a production of Minimum Effort Media. There are new videos here on the first Friday of every month. If you would like to own a copy of the book discussed in this video, The Heroine's Journey by Gail Carriger, I host a giveaway with each video I release on the topic. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber with notifications turned on, like the video, and leave a comment for me to randomly select. Terms and conditions are in the description. The winner from the last video is on screen right now. Please contact me at The Lazy Stoic across all social media. And thank you for watching.